Hello and welcome to episode number 232 of the Armin Show podcast. We are in the place to be. We have a guest today, the author of this wonderful book, Blueprint, Dr. Nicholas Christakis, a Greek-American sociologist and physician known for his research on social networks and the socioeconomic, biosocial, and evolutionary determinants of behavior, health, and longevity. Our last episode was about longevity, so maybe we can connect back to that. He is the Sterling Professor of Social and Natural Science at Yale University, where he directs the Human Nature Lab. Also co-director of the Yale Institute for Network Science. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Armin. Thank you for having me. This is a wonderful thing. The first thing I want to mention is I like that this was written in 2019. Your last book was in 2009, and the other one was in 1999. You've written a book once every 10 years. That is consistency. <laughs> Did you plan that out? <laughs> that is a very subtle, you know, it's funny you mentioned because I noticed that too. And uh, no, it takes about 10 years because I don't just write books. You know, I have a lab that I run and uh, other obligations. But um, but I am starting a new book, and I don't think it'll take 10 years for me to get to the next one. That makes sense. Suddenly, this, this is quicker. Although, That's you cool. know, maybe for consistency, I should take <laughs> years. This book was actually delayed a few years uh, so for various reasons. So, I, uh, so it should have come out earlier. But I think every 10 years is about right. Mm-hmm. I noticed that around in 2009, I had a blog, and I believe I noticed your book at the time, because I remember I was looking at social networks, and uh, like they were just starting to spring up, but I, didn't, uh, I wasn't yes. doing episodes at that time. This is wonderful. Now, as far as this category, I always like to check this category of research that you do, which is actually large. You have multiple. I always like that when there's multiple categories, kind of like individuals at the Santa Fe Institute that connect multiple fields. What led you into this? A set of categories, human behavior, networks, and such. Well, I mean, I, I, um, I was always curious as a young person, and I am very ecumenical in my approach to the sciences. You know, I think there's wisdom to be found everywhere, uh, and no discipline and no person has full mastery on the truth of the world. So I was always very interdisciplinary in my orientation. I went to medical school. Actually, when I went to college, I, um, I wanted to study linguistics. I was very interested in languages. This was in 1979. And, um, but I also wanted to be a doctor because I grew up, my mother was terminally ill when I was a boy, and all her sons became doctors, which is another typical thing. And uh, yeah. all three of her sons became doctors. And yeah. uh, she died when I was 25. But yeah. anyway, but... Um, uh, and then when I was in medical school, I didn't, um, I mean, when I was in college, I wanted to study linguistics, but I didn't have the bravery or the character at the time to really do what I wanted. And I, I thought I would play it safe and study biology instead, because I thought it was safer to get into medical school. So I got into medical school, uh, and but I still had these interests in the social sciences and sort of the humanistic parts of human experience and, uh, and some mathematical interests and abilities and curiosities. And so while I was in medical school, my, my mother, uh, actually, I went to Harvard Medical School, and my mother, uh, in 1984, my mother died in 1987, and I needed to take a year off from medical school to help care for her. And um, so what I did is I, I enrolled in the Harvard School of Public Health, which had a more flexible schedule for me. I could fly, go back from Boston to D.C., where my mother, where I grew up, and, um, and, uh, uh, and so during that period, I started to learn epidemiology and biostatistics. So I had another different sort of way of thinking about populations and population health. And then during that period of my life, I, I had to think about what additional training to get in order to be a scientist. Mm. And for serendipitous reasons we can talk about if you're interested. I don't know. I chose sociology. Mm -hmm. So I finished medical school. I did my residency at the university. Of, I moved from Harvard to Penn. And I did my residency at the University of Pennsylvania. And then I did my PhD in sociology. And finally, in 1995, at the age of 33, I finished my education. <laughs> and I, you know, hooray. And then I went, I went to, yes, exactly. <laughs> went to the University of Chicago to begin my academic career. Oh, cool. So, so the point is, I was always interested broadly in, in social, natural, in social, biological, and computational perspectives on on human nature and here at Yale where I'm a professor now I I have a number of appointments and a number of opportunities to um, think about topics related to human nature from different perspectives mm -hmm. I noticed that as you describe things in the book and in general you're you're taking them from 
uh, what would it, what is it like right now? And then what does it look like? Would that same thing be recreated in a different society if the same dynamics were present? I like that element because it shows how, let's say, monogamy or other elements, they would have shown up regardless. It wasn't like a unique that one time. If you went back or you put it in a different scenario, it would be that way. You talked about unintentional and intentional communities in this way, and some of them we plan on, and some of them it's unplanned and it comes out a certain way. Can you tell us a little bit about how unintentional communities have informed you about human nature? Well, I mean, what I'm interested in is how our evolution has shaped not just the structure and function of our bodies, mm -hmm. not just the structure and function of our minds. I mean, natural selection has clearly played a role in the, the kind of thought processes we manifest as a species, but how natural selection has played a role in the structure and function of our societies. And if you were a mad scientist and you really wanted to test this idea very strictly, what you would do is, is you would like to find a group of babies who had never been, um, never been exposed to any kind of culture and abandon them on an island somewhere where they could somehow miraculously grow up and, uh, and see what kind of society they made. That is to say, what kind of society came naturally to them? What kind of society was innate to them? Just like as you grow up, you know, there's a typical way that pancreases work and a typical way that kidneys work. And almost unless you expose yourself to a toxin or unless there's some other unexpected event, that's how your pancreas works and that's how your kidneys work. Uh, unless you, you know, have a disease, for example. And so the question was, well, what's the kind of natural society that we make? And this is this thought experiment of abandoning babies is clearly cruel and inhumane and or impractical. And it, in fact, uh, but it's been thought about for thousands of years, and it's been called the forbidden experiment. So Herodotus writes that the, the Egyptian pharaoh Samtik I did this experiment. They, those, those, the various monarchs in the last few thousand years have tried this. A, a Scottish king in the 15th century tried it, and so forth. What they wanted, what they wanted to do, though, is they wanted to see what kind of language was innate to humans. So they they wanted to see, like you know, what if if humans weren't taught to speak, how would they speak? And so what they would typically do is they would take a couple of babies and give them to a mute shepherd up in the mountains to raise and then see what language they spoke. And when the king of Scotland did it, he was curious as to what was, you know, was framed in religious terms, his question. His, his question was, what, what language did Adam and Eve speak? And uh, allegedly, when these babies were raised, they, they spoke passable Hebrew, uh, was the conclusion of that experiment. Um, but anyway, we obviously can't do that experiment. So I was looking for other variants of that experiment that we might be able to do. Mm -hmm. in, my, in my lab, we do actual experiments where we take people and throw them together and see how they organize themselves. Uh, but I was looking for some natural experiments, and one of the ideas was to look at shipwrecks. Um, these unintentional occurrences where groups of people were thrown together on an isolated island and had to organize themselves. And um, I found a database of shipwrecks, a worldwide database. There were 9,000 shipwrecks between uh, 1500 and 1900. And I found 20 shipwrecks where at least 19 people were isolated for at least two months. And I read all the accounts that the survivors left of those wrecks and all the archaeological excavations of the wreck sites. And I tried to reconstruct, using this natural experiment, this sample of 20 uh, what kind of social order did they make for themselves? And I use many other examples as well. Right. It's nice to see that from scratch. Then there's no sort of external variable that can mess up what you're looking at. But you can't do that always with humans, ethically. Yeah, certainly. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, the shipwrecks are hardly perfect experiments. I mean, right. these are, they're often all men. You know, sometimes there's a mixed gender. They're, they're people who were, uh, you know, setting sail across oceans. Uh, they were sailors or soldiers or adventurers or... Or, or impoverished people, for example, they weren't a random draw of the human population. They um, they were not a cultural. You know, they obviously had been inculcated into cultural norms from the societies of origin. Uh, I couldn't find any Asian wrecks because the Asian powers uh, didn't develop um, ocean-going exploration the way that the European powers did. They were usually uh, their exploration and their ship voyages were often very close to shore. So the wrecks, the people that wrecked were often very quickly reunited with, uh, with local populations. And I needed isolation for the question I had in mind. So, um, so in other words, most all of my sample in that, that part of the book, they're all European uh, groups. But there are many other examples. I, you know, I, looked at, um, 
I looked at intentional communities too, communitarian movements where groups of people have said, society screwed up, let's go make society anew. And, uh, you know, they, um, uh, since Roman times, people have been doing that. I looked at communes in the 1960s. I looked at the Polynesian expansion uh, into the Pacific. I looked at uh, uh, online networks that uh, people have, uh, you know, sort of artificial societies. So I looked at many different opportunities that people had to to form social order. Mm -hmm. This is true. I like the, there's not only a broad selection of what you looked at, but also I feel like you look at it more broadly. I think those are intertwined after all the research, because then you're starting to think of it in terms of like what would affect it? What makes this not a neutral thing? That's one of the nice features from um, not being so tied to one uh, specific unit. Mm. One thing that comes to mind is in these groups, people are working together. There is some sort of good. In the book, the title is The Evolutionary Origins of a Good Society. One time, business person uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, he said, you know, we could stab each other with forks, but we're not doing that because there's some sort of innate uh, working together. Um, what makes it such that we lean towards good versus a uh, neutral society? Well, here's what I would say. In general terms, you know, I think for too long, in my view, um, scientists and the person on the street have been focused on the dark part of human nature and how natural selection has shaped us to be violent or tribalistic or mendacious or cruel. But equally, we have been shaped with or equipped with capacities for love and kindness and cooperation and teaching and um, and other wonderful qualities. And I believe that these good qualities must necessarily have outweighed the bad. They had to be more powerful than the bad qualities, because if not, if every time I came near you, you killed me or filled me with useless information, you know, with lies or were cruel to me in some way, I would be better off living as an isolated entity we would have evolved to be solitary creatures. So, so the benefits of a connected life must have outweighed the costs. And it's to those benefits that I'm oriented. Uh, I'm interested in the how natural selection has shaped or us for good, how it's equipped us with these wonderful qualities, and why. Right. That makes sense. I'm with that as well, because it feels like there's that force that has kept us moving progressively in one direction. We could have just shut this all off at some point very quickly, but... Well, I, I want to be careful. I, I don't want to get into a kind of, you know, evolution has no teleology. It's not like right. evolution is trying right. to go somewhere. Right. But the argument, in essence, is that if we're going to live socially as a mammal, so we, we, in other words, we live in groups of unrelated individuals. We're, we're not like, in, like the eusocial insects. We're not like the ants and the termites and the wasps, for example, where they're clones. They're all genetically identical in each colony. Mm. Uh, so we, we live among unrelated individuals. And if, and if we're going to live socially, uh, it turns out there's a set of rules, what I call the social suite, that is required for us to do this effectively. And, and other social mammals that have evolved to live socially also manifest these qualities. So there's something about this set of qualities that's required if we're going to have a group of creatures living together effectively. And now those qualities are qualities that we have come to see as good. Um, but it's not like, so in some ways what I'm arguing is, is that these qualities have been repeatedly evolved across the animal kingdom. Elephants have friendship and cooperation and teaching. We have friendship and cooperation and teaching. Dolphins have friendship and cooperation and teaching. And, and so these animals have independently evolved friendship, cooperation, and teaching, let's say. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and for that reason, we can make the claim that this is there's some kind of um, inevitability of that evolution, but we can't necessarily put a moral valence on it. However, we as humans <laughs> see those qualities as good qualities. So right. that's what I mean about by the evolutionary origins of a good society. Right, that makes sense. Right, evolution just goes; it has no certain like. Right. But we, answer. but it, it, but it does inexorably go to these things if we're going to live socially. And these things happen to be things that we think of as good. Right. Yeah. Now, why we think of them as good is another. I mean, you could make an argument that we think of them as good because it enhances our fitness. But, but anyway. Right. It's like self-oriented versus the earth might not think it's so mm. good or something like that. That's true. One thing that comes to mind that is very current and connects with social networks, uh, we have now had 
large scale social networks on the internet for about, I don't know, 10, 15 years or so, something like that, where uh, people have, the new stage has already kind of run through and now they're fully at scale and there's a little bit of a bounce back, like, is this good for us? Do you have any thoughts on where we are at in the internet social network landscape in 2019? Well, first of all, I would say that the kinds of networks, when I say social networks, I mean real right. face, face networks that we've been making for tens of thousands of years. So as you pointed out, the online networks have been around for, I don't know, 20 or 30 years now, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so Friendster, which people don't remember, and even some older networks right. have ex existed. But um, I think, um, I mean, these technologies are here to stay in one form or another. But I do think people are beginning to see the downside and the anomie or the emptiness of using these tools to interact socially. And people are kind of remembering like how nice it is to actually interact with your friends face to face. You know, the, the joy in having two couples over to have a meal or, you know, to go have drinks with your friend. You know, this is like a very human, very normal thing that we all crave. So I think people are, you know, after the initial excitement and exuberance about using these tools, these online tools to facilitate our friendships, I think people are beginning to see that they facilitate a certain kind of interaction, but not necessarily the kind that we most conventionally associate with real friends. Mm -hmm. Right. I've noticed that a bit. It's uh, it's very early, though, in those. Well, there are also uh, some new startups that are springing up that are trying to be tools to connect with your friends, but facilitate face to face connections with your friends. Mm -hmm. You know, like trying to lubricate the process of actually going out with your friends, not just staying in touch, you know, with Facebook posts. Right. I always think of it in terms of bandwidth, like it's high bandwidth when you're in person and really low in bandwidth uh, when it's video and then lower at audio and then lower at text. And then an emoji, I guess, is the lowest bandwidth, something like that, or a like. I, one book said that a like is a one bit uh, communication. Speaking of connection between people, uh, there's a good chunk of the book about um connections sexual connections monogamy and such um how is that adjusting currently is uh, the level of monogamy for example in the united states adjusting at the current moment i liked how you looked at how it would develop regardless of i think it was 61 different places where monogamy sprang up on its own can you speak about that well i think it's important to not confuse sort of what we when we think of monogamy in scientific terms from when people think of it in terms of a sexual practice right when i'm talking about monogamy i mean the the way in which um we human beings uh practice a kind of uh we have sustained relationship with our mates mm -hmm. and incidentally it doesn't need to be heterosexual it can also be homosexual so that's clearly not reproductive in that situation but the, the, the quality that we have that's unusual in the animal kingdom, it's not unseen. Other animals are monogamous, too. Actually, most birds are monogamous. Is that we, um, the quality that we have is that we form a sentimental attachment to the people that we're having sex with across time. So we, we don't need to love our partners. We could just mate with our partners. But we do. We do love them. We feel connected to them. And we want to be with them. This is not with every partner. Not You can have sex without love. You can have love without sex. So I'm speaking in general terms about the way evolution has shaped our species contrasted with other animals. So, so we form sustained relationships with our partners and we feel affection for them. And it's that feeling. And this, can, this affection, as I said, not only can occur in straight and gay relationships, but it also can occur in polygynous and polyandrous relationships. So one man, many women, one woman, many men. But each dyadic connection in those arrangements, there's a sentimental attachment. And that's what I'm talking about. It's that attachment, that the capacity for affection that has been shaped by natural selection that's seen universally with one exception that I discuss in the book, and that is such an important feature of our humanity. Mm -hmm. I do like always, always the exceptions tell you quite a bit. It's always nice to have them in life, because or like extremophiles when you're researching response yeah. to the environment yes one thing i was thinking about uh as far as that or pair bonding how how alterable is a person's pair bonding ability if you change their vasopressin or oxytocin receptor 
uh, capacity. Mm. How, how much can neurotransmit, neurotransmitter changes affect someone's ability to connect or interest even in connecting? Is that even a thing? Well, I mean, this is like asking all these functions, all these, let's say, physical functions we evolved to have. You know, I could derange your pancreas by giving you drugs, mm -hmm. and I could derange your kidneys by giving you drugs, and I can re derange your social interactions by giving you drugs. And so these drugs could, for instance, as you're suggesting, manipulate the oxytocin and vasopressin pathways. I could increase your affectionateness or decrease it, you know, for example. And so, yes, it, at an individual level, you can do that. But that's a rather different question than right. your evolved capacity, right. why your brain is the way, why the human brain, not even your individual brain, why the human brain is the way that it is, you know, compared to other kinds of brains we might have had. That makes sense. Yeah. I always like to look at it broadly, but once in a while, I like to it's look a little at it. Like, I don't have this. I don't have this. Uh, uh, I don't have this science. I don't know this science very clearly, so I want to be careful not to misstate something. But my understanding mm -hmm. is that we sleep and dolphins sleep, but dolphins sleep in a very different way than we do. Uh, and, you know, our last common ancestor with dolphins was like 80 million years ago or something. So they they independently, you know, evolved certain brain features uh, associated with sleep. So we might say, well, we we both have this behavior, but we do it in a very different way, and let's say for different reasons. Mm -hmm. Right. They don't do it just like we do it, but yeah. we both have some sort of rest component to it. Yes. That makes sense. One thing I noticed uh, in your description, uh, you're at the boundary of natural and social sciences. What is that boundary? What is the... Well, let's I don't you I can't tell you what the boundary is, but I can tell you that it's very thoroughly policed. And if you cross, <laughs> cross if you cross the boundary, you get smacked. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are there are questions that uh, intersect with the biological and social sciences. For example, a very typical illustration would be behavior genetics. You know, what what behaviors have we, you know, are shaped by our genes? You know, for example, your risk aversion or your religiosity. Instead of seeing Religion is just a social phenomenon. We can see it as a biological phenomenon as well. Uh, so those would be uh, that would be a, a typical question. Or, or for example, another question might be, how does poverty kill you? You know, so it's well understood that being poor is a risk factor for dying. But how exactly? You know, how does poverty get under your skin? What's the biology of poverty that leads to a shortening of life, like inside your body? which genes are turned on and off, for example, or what kind of physiologic stresses have occurred in your body, that would be a question at the border of the social and the biological sciences, right? Understanding how this social factor, but poverty, uh, is biologized, is converted into a, an outcome, a biological outcome in an individual. Mm -hmm. This sort of connects with uh, recently the uh, previous episode I talked with Dr. David Sinclair, author of Lifespan, about longevity, and he talked a bit about... Um, methylation or acetylation of DNA showing impacts of past uh, stress, physiological stress. That's kind of a cool uh, inner detail there. I knew David the, when I was at Harvard, a professor at Harvard Medical School. So he and I were there at the same time. Oh, yeah. this is wonderful. Uh, yeah, I, I, I was there when he first published the first study on the components of red wine. And uh, of course, the doses is required in those animals is enormous compared to the amount you get from drinking a few glasses yourself. <laughs> yes. Right. Is that where the resveratrol was in? Yes. Yes. That's wonderful. Yeah. I uh, talked a bit about longevity and some of those factors of what can actually possibly be reversed or cleared out in the future, which is kind of a cool thing. One of my favorite parts of your book is the middle part where there are images and there's like descriptions underneath them about different games or different uh, organizations of people. I want to discuss a few of those because I really identify with the messages behind them. One of them, the network cooperation game, when there's a network of people and there's a fixed condition, it leads to people who are the defectors uh, winning out because it's sort of like, oh, don't cheat me, I'll cheat you first, versus if there's a fluid condition and people can choose who to work with, uh, cooperation is higher and uh, cooperators are supported and they have more connections. Um, have you seen examples of this play out in societies currently? Yeah. Yeah, so the, the, that experiment's an experiment. We, we have this software in my lab that allows us to create temporary artificial societies of real people where mm -hmm. we recruit thousands of subjects online and they come to our laboratory for half an hour, an hour, and play some games. And then we, in a godlike way, can experimentally manipulate those societies 
and test ideas. The experiment you're alluding to is an experiment in which we, we took groups of people, uh, let's say about 20 people, we dropped them into a little network, a little pattern of ties, and we introduced each person to their particular neighbors. So everyone had different neighbors. And we said, okay, now you guys, each of you has to cooperate with your neighbors. You have to play a kind of so-called public goods game where if you contribute to the well-being of your neighbors, everyone is better off. But of course, each individual is very tempted not to cooperate, is tempted to defect and hope that everyone else contributes to the public good and you'll just be an exploitative defector. You know, you won't contribute. It's like those high school science projects you had, you know, when, when the teacher puts four of you together and says, okay, you guys have to do a project and it'll give you one grade and mm -hmm. everyone else is lazy and not doing the work. And now your choice is either you do everyone else's work or you also get lazy and don't do the project and then you all get an F. So, and in that type of situation, what often happens is, as we showed in that experiment, is that, uh, is that, um, is that uh, people start defecting. Because, you know, I drop you in the network, you're abused by your neighbors, and so after a while you say, to hell with that, and you switch to defection. And by the end, as you said, Armin, the society's full of defectors. Mm -hmm. But in a different branch of the experiment, what we did is, is we allowed people some control over who they were connected to. So in addition to choosing at every moment in time whether to cooperate or defect, they also could choose whether to, uh, who to connect to. And in that type of a society, uh, cooperation is sustained and persists. People cooperate with each other. And so we call this social fluidity, the degree to which ties are rewired at every time step. Or can you change 5% of your ties at every time step or 20% or 50% of your ties? Like at any given moment, how many of your ties can be cut or reformed? Or 100%, you know, at every moment, all of your ties are. And in a subsequent experiment, what we found is, is that if you if you plot on the x-axis social fluidity and on the y-axis uh, cooperativity, we find this parabolic shape so that at low levels of social fluidity, when social groups are fixed, when everyone is stuck with particular people, cooperation is very low. And at very high social fluidity, at 100%, when every moment you have new neighbors, cooperation is low. But in the intermediate range, where you have some social fluidity, you get the maximum cooperation. And um, and I can give you, you asked for some real life examples of this. Let me let me give you an example. So imagine the, the situation of divorce. If you were live in a society, let's say up until recently, like Ireland, in which divorce is prohibited, then uh, if one member of a couple is awful and the other member can't leave, really the only strategy available to the other member is also to become awful. So now you have two people that are just mean to each other forever. <laughs> I mean, that just is awful, right? They don't make investments in their marriage. They don't make investments in each other. It's, it's, it's suboptimal. At the other extreme, if divorce is too easy and you have a new wife every day, you also don't make investments in your marriage because you know, you're, you'll have a different spouse tomorrow. Why would you invest in the spouse today? Tomorrow you'll have a different spouse. So you want social institutions that make divorce possible, but not too easy, right? So you want a regime of institutions that stabilize marriage, that incentivize people to, to, to invest, to take care of each other, to be their best selves. And in fact, that's what we have in most societies. Most societies make divorce difficult, but not impossible. Or another example might be the institutional policies regarding home ownership. If you live in a if you live in a neighborhood in which nobody can ever move, like the Soviet you know, housing blocks, everyone is assigned an apartment and they have the apartment for the rest of their life and they're stuck there. And your neighbors start acting like jerks and throwing garbage into the hallway. I mean, what are your choices? You clean up your neighbor's garbage or you keep your hallway clean and then garbage overflows into it? No, what happens is you become a garbage maker too. You start throwing garbage. And so, and so everything starts... Uh, collapse, uh, uh, everything collapses, you know, like everything, everyone, you know, doesn't invest in the social uh, order. So that's not good for neighborhood cooperation. But now let's consider the other extreme, instead of rigid housing assignments, totally fluid housing assignments. Every day you have different neighbors, no neighborhood stability. People come and go all the time. Well, in that type of a social order too, there would be uh, no investment in the commons, you know, because why should you go and clean your, the sidewalk in front of your house or help your neighbor because tomorrow that neighbor will be gone. 
So we have policies in our societies that make uh, sort of incentivize neighborhood stability, but don't lock it down. You know, we try to encourage people to stay put, but we don't prohibit them from leaving. So these are two examples of how social fluidity is so important in fostering a sense of communal well-being and cooperation. Did I answer your question? Mm -hmm. I did like that. You had mentioned that, yeah, rules of social connection lead to kind or mean behavior. It's sort of like, I like this concept because it, the environment is so impactful. We'll go through an environment and then it's nice to have a sense that, oh, these, this certain city or this certain kind of uh, setup leads to these feelings of animosity or these people getting along. Yeah, I mean, I think you're, you're highlighting another idea, which is very deep and important in my view, which is that, um, and here I usually use the metaphor of carbon. So most people learned in high school chemistry that if you take carbon atoms and you connect them one way, you get graphite, which is soft and dark. Or take the same carbon atoms and connect them another way, you get diamond, which is diamond. hard and clear. And so there are two key intellectual ideas there. First of all, these properties of softness and darkness and hardness and clearness aren't properties of the carbon atoms. They're properties of the collection of carbon atoms. And second, which properties you get depends on how you connect the carbon atoms to each other. You connect them one way, you get one set of properties. Take the same carbon atoms and connect them another way, you get a different set of properties. So, And it's the same with social groups. You can take a group of people and connect them one way, and they're cooperative and nice to each other, or take the same human beings and connect them another way, and they're uncooperative and not nice to each other. And what that means is that these properties that you might think of as properties of individuals are actually properties of groups. These, these properties of cooperativity, it's not, just, it's not just who's in a group, it's how they're connected that helps explain how nice the group is. And we've done many experiments in my lab that have explored these ideas, that have experimentally manipulated the social structure of groups in order to test, yes, I can take a group of people and I connect them one way, and they're really nice to each other. I take the same people and connect them a different way, and they're awful to each other. And this, in turn, is relevant to all kinds of other problems in our society. For example, the torture of prisoners. So you can take a group of good soldiers, and you put them in an environment, and you connect them some way, and they start acting in an awful way. They torture prisoners. Or not. A different environment. It's sort of bad apples versus bad barrels kind of idea. And we humans create the barrels in which we reside, and those barrels in turn can, can uh, corrupt us or elevate us. Mm -hmm. This exactly made me think of, I don't know if it was Scale by Jeffrey West or A Crude Look at the Hole by John H. Miller, but talked about how if you have a, a city that's double in size, people walk 10% faster. If it's another doubling in size, people walk 10% faster. The impact on you uh, based on where you're at, and now in social network, the good or the kindness or the animosity that you bring. I like the metaphor that you brought about the carbon. That one is very, uh, I guess, the point across clearly. And another thing you brought up, uh, like divorce and how that set up marriage as a construct, or like for uh, cellular adversity, uh, having little bits of fasting. That was a separate one, but like Ramadan. We built these things from a long time ago that now we, uh, we see the reason now but long ago, there was just adaptations that people built up that, okay, we'll use this to, it seems like it's working. It seems like it's working. So, Well, I talk about, I mean, this is funny because, I mean, how did the ancients know what was good and what was bad? Some of it was pragmatic. You know, they, they noticed that people who observed who fast seemed to fare better. And some of it was serendipity, and they have no uh, knowledge. So in the, in the book, I talk about the case of, um, of uh, uh, blow dart toxin. You know, these elaborate preparation of curare toxin by Amazonian Indians, they can't actually, they can tell you how to prepare the toxin and the complicated sequence of steps and ingredients that need to be added together and prepared in very elaborate ways. This needs to be pounded, this needs to be dried, this needs to be soaked in water and mixed in a certain sequence, not the wrong sequence, the right order, you know, etc. cetera. Uh, but they can't tell you what each step is doing. So how do these very elaborate con cultural constructs arise um, they might know that it's functional, and if you do that, you get a poison that will kill a, you know, will kill a, a prey item. But um, but they don't tell, they can't tell you why. So so yes, I think there was a lot of trial and error that resulted in in cultural practices that were beneficial or useful. And but sometimes also, let's say they people get locked into practices that are not so good. So the famous case that Napoleon Chagnon studied of uh, the Yanomamo you know, who are locked into these awful, violent practices where they were 
a third of Yanomama men were dying from murder and, and violence. Uh, and they knew it was awful, but they, they were locked into it like a vendetta. They couldn't get out. So culture can lead us astray, too. Mm -hmm. This is true. It's sort of like it was mechanical or functional at the time. Maybe the why was not understood. Mm -hmm. We understand more of the why now. At that time, it was, we have to do this. It seems like we're living. Let's yes. keep going. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Right. One thing I noticed, uh, speaking back to the past and connecting to now, you have an image where it represents tracks of elephants seven mil million years ago in fossils yeah. and how those tracks match the same uh, females walking in a parallel lines and then a male walking diagonally across them yes. today. Uh, do you notice this across various categories where the same thing from long, long ago is exactly the same as it is right now? in us as organisms. Yeah, so that, that is a famous uh, trackway in the United Arab Emirates where they, there's a, a group of about 10 or 12 females and youngsters walking in a herd and then a solitary male's tracks like are crossing diagonally. And the number of animals and the motion of the animals and the solitary male that is on his own, you know, and periodically intersects with them, those are all behaviors still seen in elephants today. So we can use these fossilized tracks to make inferences about ancient animals, and um, and then we can compare it to today's animals. Another very poignant example that I discuss is, is when you look at mastodon uh, 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 skeletons that we have, uh, the majority, I think the great majority, are male. Well, why is that? And it turns out that a lot of the mastodon skeletons we have are because the mastodons got stuck in a crevasse or fell into a tar pit or did something stupid, uh, <laughs> and that resulted in them being dying and their fossils being preserved in an environment in which they were preserved. And, um, and the theory is that the reason that this happened is that the males were more likely to be on their own when they got into trouble and there was no one there to help them, whereas the female, because they were solitary, whereas the females, of course, were moving in groups. So when a, one female got into a bog, another one could come and pull them out. And so one of the theories, just from the gender ratio of the skeletons that they can make using mastodon skeleton gender ratios or sex ratios, they can make inferences about the behavior of the mastodons that triangulates with what we know about modern, you know, uh, elephant type uh, organisms, which live the same way. So, um, so, you know, um, so, uh, so, yeah, so it's very miraculous to look at these these fossilized behaviors and see evidence of them in living creatures. Um, and there's some evidence of this in humans as well, although it's much more difficult with humans. Mm -hmm. We have some patterns that we'll repeat for a long time. I always think about like how much variety can there be if we're running with the same receptor pathways as people from long ago. We must have well, a lot. Yeah. One of the most famous examples of this is, a, is an example by Dan Lieberman, the physical anthropologist at Harvard, it's a complicated story, but let me see if I can tell you the story, which is one of the ways that we hunt. There's something called a persistence hunt. So if in a sh so 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 if I go running after an animal, I mean my my dachshund can run faster than me. There's no way that you can catch almost any animal can run faster than a human. And uh, but we are long distance runners, so we can run for a long distance, and animals cannot do that. So right. one of the ways that you can kill big game in Africa is to just chase it for a long time. So a group of us are gonna chase this antelope for hours, which humans can do, we can run for hours, and eventually the animal will sprint ahead of us, and then we'll keep chasing it, and we'll sprint ahead of us, and sprint ahead of us, and eventually the animal will collapse from exhaustion, and you can walk up to the animal with a big pointed stick and spear it and kill it, because it's collapsed from exhaustion. This is called a persistence hunt. But mm -hmm. the interesting thing about this is, that in order to engage in a persistence hunt, you have to be able to track the animal. Mm -hmm. That is to say, you, you humans need the knowledge of, of because the animal will sprint out of sight. So you have to mm -hmm. be able to look at its footprints. And as any hunter will tell you, it's difficult to track animals. It's an acquired skill. You have to be taught to do it. It's culturally transmitted knowledge how to hunt these animals. And so what's amazing is that we can look at the morphology of human feet we can look at foot bones from our ancestors hundreds of thousands of years ago and see that they had foot bones that were adopted for long distance running. And because of those foot bone anatomy, we can make an inference that those, those creatures, those hominids, engaged in social learning and teaching. 
because they had the feet that were required for persistence hunts, and persistence hunts can only be executed when you have the social transmission of hunting knowledge. So you understand this is a very complicated story, but you can tell you can tell something about how how we were socially organized long ago by looking at foot bones. Isn't that amazing? Amazing. Is. Yeah. That is pretty amazing, right? Then you're like, oh, they had to be working together. In they had to be working together. They had the kind of feet that were required for people who were working together because they were running long distances and they weren't jogging for fun. They had a reason to do this. Right. No, that is a wonderful thing. It's nice to see that, like, this had to be done. This was a group-oriented thing. Yes. Speaking of groups, one the last image I wanted to mention about in the book is the one about the leaders. When there's multiple leaders in a group and then they were removed, it almost looks like the groups were left confused. It was more than just the leaders yeah. were removed. It's sort of like, we've lost our... We don't yeah. get it. Can you speak on that concept? Yeah, this is work by Jessica Flack at, uh, at the Santa Fe Institute, um, formerly at Wisconsin. So what she did... Actually, she did this work when she was at Emory with Franz de Waal. She did these experiments where she took these primates and she mapped their networks, and then she took the person who was the leader out, and chaos ensued. Because all of a sudden, all these other primates were competing for who would be the top dog. And so the inference is that the presence of a uh, mild hierarchy in these, in these primate groups, a little bit of a th order, a little bit of leadership, allowed the, the leader tamped down on violence among everyone else. So, so the existence of leadership and the existence of some hierarchy is not just beneficial for the guy at the top is the argument, it's beneficial for everyone, and um, and yeah, and the, and those images uh, illustrate that point. Mm -hmm. yeah, I noticed that it was like it wasn't just the leaders were taken out; it was like the group is now like, what do we do? We're not sure. Let's yes, let's regroup. Let's fight it out. Exactly. Right. Uh, one thing, uh, self awareness. I always like to check on that. Uh, how early on in life were you self aware of your abilities or skills or what you identify with? Wow, that's a tough question. I um sort of a poignant question in some ways. I um I uh I have grown children who are in their 20s. I'm 57. Mm -hmm. And uh for the last few years we've been foster parents and we recently adopted our fourth child. We our first three were biological children. We adopted this little boy. Mm -hmm. And um he had a very traumatic childhood he came to us when he was seven mm -hmm. and i i'm very curious as to what he will remember when he's older so i've been thinking about the question you just put to me for a very long time or for the last couple of years because i i can remember some things that happened to me when i was i think my earliest memories are from when i was three three and a half but i can't remember anymore what it was like to be five or six or seven or ten. The earliest I can remember what it was like to be was when I was a teenager, like 16. I can remember what it felt like to be a 16-year-old or a 20-year-old. I cannot remember what it was like to be four or five anymore. I, I have a memory of myself in, in first grade when I was six, walking home from school, and I have that sensation of pushing in the fall. I lived in D.C., the leaves, kicking the leaves through my feet and thinking this was a glorious thing to do you know the leaves were piled up on the sidewalks and you could kick them yes yes i have that memory you know so i, I have memories salient memories i remember if fl my father teaching me to fly a kite uh and the, uh, the first time you know that i flew a kite and uh, it was just so joyful um but i don't remember what i was thinking and i i don't know whether other men or women in their 50s do you remember you're younger than me do you remember being five no the only thing is I have like a one memory kind of like that. One time like walking, uh, I got a cookie from the kindergarten and then I walked with my friend down the stairs. That's it. Yeah, I have a memory like that. One of my memories from when I was four, my mother was a teacher. We lived in Greece then. Was, mm -hmm. uh, was my mother loved uh, strawberry ice cream. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I remember buying uh, some strawberry ice cream, running down a hallway where she worked to buy some strawberry ice cream one day. Uh, but again, I, the point is, so in answer to your question, of course, I have memories that are very going back to when I was, you know, three, maybe. But I, I don't remember what it's like anymore, what, I what it was like to be a child anymore. And I kind of wish I did, actually. I miss it. I wish I could remember what it was like to be a child. You mm -hmm. know, 
so famously said that he's he spent his whole life learning to draw like a child, you know, trying to recreate what it was like to draw like a child. And if you look at the if you look at the arc of his art, you know, he was a he he could play he could paint it, when he was in his twenties he could already paint like you know masters. You know, he painted very representational, very perfect kind of art. And then his more all his other you know, blue period and cubism and everything else all came later. You know, he had to learn to do that later again, just sort of going back to when he was a baby. Which artist, by the way, I think the name got cut off right at the beginning. Picasso. Oh, Picasso, yeah, yeah. No, I've noticed that in life, it's, uh, we've described it like, you know, from youth, there's the youth part, then there's the middle where you're doing a lot, and then older age goes back to basically similar to youth uh, <laughs> in our ways. It's kind of a cool feature. The last question I always like to check on, if you had like a megaphone to speak, to all of humanity, what is a sentence you would say that would represent something about what you'd want them to know? A sentence or a couple sentences. The arc of our evolutionary history is long, but it bends towards goodness. That is wonderful. And that's the representation of this book. Oh, I'm stealing from MLK, so it better be good. <laughs> <laughs> Inside information. That's pretty good. That's cool. I would like to thank and you for having me. Thank you, Armin. Thank you so much for having me. This has been a great thing. Episode 232, and we are out.